What I want to do today is talk a little bit about, um, it seems like it's a very heady, uh, pointy heady maybe, uh, subject of risk management strategies. But in reality, water managers have been dealing with risk management uh, for hundreds of years, uh, really maybe even thousands of years, uh, going back to the Roman engineers uh, who actually designed some very sophisticated and very wonderful systems, uh, some of which are still providing water today. And in fact, if you look at the history, uh, one of the things that led to the Renaissance and some of the, some of the things in the 14th century or the 1400s and 1300s was that they actually got together and started rebuilding some of the water systems. Uh, that were providing water that the, the Romans did years ago. So we've been really, as, as water folks, we've been dealing with risk management for a long, long time. Uh, we dealt with it in trying to avoid floods. We dealt with it in trying to make sure that we could build reservoirs and, and, and have a water supply through the season. So risk management uh, is, may sound like we're an insurance company, but it's really what the water business has been, uh, been about for many years. Let's see if I get the right one here. Nope, I didn't. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the Colorado River Compact. Uh, to begin to talk about risk, we got to say, well, what, are, what do we have and what are the compact issues? And we've had this discussion at this seminar many times, and we're going to keep repeating it because it is it's such an important basic. Uh, but the Colorado River Compact, under the compact, the four states of the upper division, uh, Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, uh, and New Mexico have certain obligations at Lee Ferry. The first obligation is not to deplete the flow below an aggregate of 75 million over any 10 consecutive years. Now, I don't want to call that a flow obligation because it's up to us. So if nature depletes water below 75 million acre feet over 10 years and not the upper basin states, then we're not the ones that are causing that. So that's a subtlety, but it's an important subtlety and one that the CWCB staff and others uh, pick up and point to a lot. The second obligation we have at Lee Ferry, uh, and this one remains unsettled. Uh, there's a lot of controversy over it, and I really couldn't tell you what it is, and nobody knows. We've been, we've been dodging it for about 60 years in the name of risk management. Uh, it's that we have to deliver, the upper basin states have to deliver uh, to Lee Ferry, in addition to the 75 over 10, half of the deficiency uh, to the Mexican Treaty. Okay, so right now, in uh, 1944, the United States and, and uh, uh, Mexico entered into a water treaty that covered three rivers, the Tijuana, the Rio Grande, and the Colorado River system, and under that, uh, we basically have an annual obligation to provide Mexico with a million and a half in surplus condimes that goes up under conditions of extraordinary drought or other emergencies, a million and a half can go down. But those are the two obligations at Lee Ferry. 75 over 10 uh, and half of the Mexican Treaty deficiency. Uh, again, at which the deficiency has never been really uh, well, well agreed to, let's put it that way. Now, in the upper Colorado River, uh, we, we hear a lot about the 22 compact, but in 1948, five states, Arizona actually has upper basin interests, uh, a little piece of northern Arizona above Lee Ferry is in the upper basin. So the, the, the four states I mentioned, plus Arizona, plus the United States Congress, entered into the upper basin compact. Uh, and we're, we don't really, this is kind of the, the second, the, the junior compact, if you want to say it, because it happened later and it's, and it's smaller and it doesn't, didn't receive as much attention in the news and those kinds of things. But in terms of risk management and in terms of our future, it's a very important document. And what the 48 compact did was, its purpose was an equitable division among the, the, those five states of the water apportioned under the 22 compact to the upper basin. But it also did this. It established the obligations for each state in the upper division with respect to those deliveries of water required to be made at Lee Ferry, the ones I just mentioned. So the upper basin compact in the, in, in the face of risk management and shortage becomes very, very important. Okay? It becomes the controlling document, if you want to say, uh, in what we have to do 
in terms of compact administration for an upper basin state. So that's the procedures and methodologies for determining how much water Colorado or the other states uh, have to provide in the event of a curtailment under the 22 compact. So the 22 compact is what provides the curtailment. The 48 compact tells us in the event of a curtailment how much Colorado and each of the other states, what we have to do in, resp in response to that. Uh, some real important implications, and we've discussed this in the past, but I think it, it bears repeating many times, and that's in 1922, um, the negotiators of that compact understood property rights, understood water rights. Uh, they weren't, you know, we didn't have as many water lawyers then, but we had enough. Uh, and they understood that what the compact commission did in 1922 couldn't impact all the water rights in the basin that had already been perfected under various state laws. So present perfected rights to the beneficial use of waters in the Colorado River system are unimpaired by this compact. And that was a property rights protection clause. Now, in the 48 compact acknowledged that. So in, make, in addressing how much water a state like Colorado would have to provide in the, in the event of a curtailment, it excludes water rights that were perfected prior to 20, November 24, 1922 from curtailment. Now, the issue of what's the perfected, what's the date of when it, what's a pre-compact right, what's a post-compact right, that's still subject to a lot of discussion and possibly even court case. Uh, but in the case of the Upper Colorado, in the case of determining uh, the methodologies, the 48 compact jumped the gun and it, uh, it basically provides the date and that's November 24th, 1922. That's the date the eight commissioners, the seven from each of the states and the United States commissioner, uh, Mr. Hoover, uh, signed the compact. It was then of course subject to ratification. That ratification actually took another 22 years. It wasn't until 1944 that Arizona ratified this. Now here's the 10-year flow at Lee Ferry. This is an old graph. Uh, and if you really look at, at what's going to happen is we're going to see a jump up here of about 4 million acre feet. So this year, uh, what, based on what Kevin said, we're going to see an uptick. Whoops. Oh, well. Um, can you back that up? Uh, let's see if I... I'm going the wrong way here. Yeah, just back it up to where I was with the, uh, there, there you go. So if you see what, what happened um, on this 10 year running average, uh, in the period in the mid 80s, this was very high. We had a dry period from about 87 to about 94, 95. It went ticked down. Uh, then it went back up for our, the wet period we had in the late 90s. And in response to the, to the 2000 to 2010 or so, 2010 dry period, uh, it went back down and it actually came down pretty close to about 83 million acre feet, uh, which means it was coming in, it was zeroing in on one of the potential triggers uh, for a curtailment. Curtailment risks, I'll just go through these quickly. What are the variables? Well, future hydrology, uh, the supply of water, the development in the basin. What's gonna happen to the demand for water on the front range, on the Wasatch front, to energy industry, those kinds of things. What's gonna happen to the demand for existing uses as temperatures goes up, or if temperatures go up? And what are the curtailment triggers? So when we, do, when we look at things like the Colorado River Water Availability Study, which is receiving a lot of attention now, uh, we say, how much water does Colorado have to develop? You've got to make assumptions concerning these three basic things. What's the future hydrology gonna look like? What's the future demands gonna look like? And what are the curtailment triggers? And there is uncertainty in all three of those. There's a lot of uncertainty right there. There's seven and a half million acre feet over 10 years of uncertainty on that curtailment trigger. So those are some of the questions uh, that are very difficult to answer uh, in terms of how much water Colorado has left to develop. 
Now, future, what we know about future hydrology is that is science says that it's very likely, not certain, but very likely that temperatures will go up. That includes even folks like uh, Professor Gray at CSU, who is somewhat of a skeptic on, on man-made climate change, but he will tell you that he thinks the Colorado River is going back to what it looked like from about 800 AD to about 1300 AD, uh, which is great news if you don't like climate change, but it doesn't make any difference if you're in the water business because flows were very low during that period anyway. Temperatures are what are important to us in the water business, not whether those temperatures, not how much of those temperatures were caused either by greenhouse gases or by natural, or by natural uh, conditions. That's a subtlety that I think we need to think about. Precipitation, a lot of uncertainty uh, in what's going to happen with precipitation. Uh, and water availability, likely to go, it's likely to go down simple be because we're going to use more in the upper basin. Uh, that is happening throughout with all of the states. So we do know, if you look at future hydrology, temperatures are likely to go up, precipitation, uncertain, water availability down as demands go up. So upper water development in the upper basin, upper basin current uses, if temperatures go up, and this is gonna be in the, in the Bureau's basin study, and this was in the Colorado River Water Availability Study done by the CWCB. This is one of those things that we don't think about, but as temperatures go up, crop irrigation requirements go up, and if crop irrigation requirements go up and a water supply exists, consumptive uses are going up, and that number is potentially very large for the upper basin. That number is in the order of a million, half a million to a million acre feet based on m relatively small increases in temperature compared to what they might be in the four to six, four to six degree uh, increase over the next, say, 50 years. Uh, so that number is very big, and that means that if we did nothing, if we had no new projects, we could still have problems with water availability as our existing systems and our existing temperatures go up. The Front Range Water Council is an interesting, in the, in the IBCC process, uh, one of them said, well, we're going to make the assumptions that our demands are going up by 5 to 10 percent because lawns in the Front Range are going to take, are going to, are going to take more water. Reasonable assumption. Now, does that, what does that mean for the rest of, of the basin? That's a good question. So here's a conceptual graph. And when I talk about the risk, this is just conceptual. I'm talking about the risk of a curtailment in the future. And if there is no temperature change, if we simply use existing hydrology, go back to 1950 to about 2007, that risk is low, but it is still real. It is still on the order. Uh, it is still something that's, that's out there that's maybe 5 to 10%. As you look at moderate temperature increases, assuming similar precipitation changes, you know, we don't, you know you're, that, that risk goes up. If you look at large temperature increases, that risk goes quite a ways up. And some of the early numbers I've seen is that risk by 2050 could be as much as 30 to 50 percent in a given year. Those are the curtailment triggers. We talked about them before. Is it 75? Is it 82? Is it something in between? Um, curtailment issues, impacts, pre-1922 pre rights, not affected, but that means they're a great resource in terms of a curtailment. That means if you have a pre-1922 water right, that there's, some, there's an extra value to those because of the compact issues. It also means from a public policy perspective, for years and years and years, Colorado has abandoned pre-1922 rights uh, relatively frequently, every 10 years, a bunch of them end up on the abandonment list. Is that really a good policy decision to do that? Uh, Post-1922 reservoir storage, West Slope municipal supplies. Many of our West Slope municipalities, like Glenwood Springs, have pre-1922 rights, but many of the newer ones, especially on the, uh, on the, on the resort communities, which are new, uh, have post-1922 rights. Front range, Trans Mountain su Diversion Supplies, with a small exception of some very small Trans Mountain Diversions like the first half of the Grand River Ditch. Most front range Trans Mountain Diversions are post-1922. Snowmaking Supplies, well, they sure didn't think about, they just, no one in 1922 thought that, that, uh, that Copper Mountain would be making snow uh, to ski on. I mean, they'd have thought you were crazy, okay? but. Most snowmaking supplies are basically post-1977, uh, after that drought. 
And then finally, thermoelectric power plants and cooling water and those things. Those are all uses that are, for the most part, post-1922. Strategies, and I'm just going to go over these quickly. Um, there are four major strategies, and, and maybe five or six, but I'm going to talk about four of them. Optiva optimization of our large main stem reservoirs, Lake Powell, uh, Flaming Gorge, Navajo, uh, Aspinall. Creation of contingency plans. We're working on that with the Front Range. We're working on that with the Southwest, the CWCB. Can, what do we do if we have a curtailment? Should, do we have a contingency plan out there? Do we base it on, a, you know, we're looking at this water bank concept using pre-1922 rights in a water bank on a, on a willing seller or willing, or willing lessee, willing lessor basis uh, to get through critical uses. We're looking at that concept. It's not easy, but we're looking at it. Um, development of new institutional arrangements. That's how far are we going to bend the 22 and 48 compacts to survive a curtailment or to address a curtailment. And then finally, litigation. Uh, and one of my, our first, uh, when we were putting this uh, PowerPoint together, I said, use of litigation as a last resort. And I thought, oh, that's wishful thinking. In many states, litigation is the first resort, Arizona. Okay, reservoir optimization. Their primary purpose, from my perspective, uh, and there is some debate about this, is to enable the upper basin to meet its compact obligations. In 1922, the negotiators of the 22 compact were discussing a large reservoir at Glen Canyon Dam for the specific purpose of stabilizing those flows, storing wet year water, releasing them in dry years, so the upper basin could meet its obligations under the 22 compact. So how do we use them in the best way to do that? They really worked well uh, in the past, but are we getting everything we can out of those? Do we need more? Good question. Um, I hope we look at that in, in a serious way. Uh, in the 1960s, we looked at how big should Lake Powell be, uh, and a study done by the state of Colorado suggested if you go too big, the incremental evaporation losses exceed the value of the additional stabilization. So there is at some point where additional reservoir storage hurts rather than helps. And where are we on that? A secondary purpose is to meet upper basin consumptive uses. So if you have a contract from Flaming Gorge is the primary purpose. If, if you have a curtailment and you have a contract, should you use that water to help all of the upper basin states meet their obligations and all water users? or should it, be, should it be delivered under a contract purpose? This is one of those tough questions. Um, reservoir operation issues, uh, we just talked about that. And I, I really, uh, in, the, in the law, there's something called 602A insurance storage. And this is, I call this the minimum insurance level that the upper basin negotiated in 1968, is that there's a certain level in Lake Powell and the upper basin states referred to it as 602A storage. Below that, we're at an elevated risk of, of a compact curtailment. Above that, we feel pretty good. Uh, it's like if you own a home that's worth $300,000 and you want $300,000 worth of fire insurance, you're feeling or more, you're feeling pretty good. If you have 200, you're not feeling very good. And we've been debating that for a long time. The lower basin would like to see that level go down. The upper basin would like to see that level as high as possible. Uh, and that's one of those issues that was put off in the uh, 2007 agreement, but it will come back in the future. And there's an example of, of uh, different 602A levels. Ironically, if you assume dry enough hydrology or high enough upper basin demands, 602A rapidly exceeds the available storage, which means you're comfortable when they're full. If they're drawn down, you're not comfortable under certain conditions. Contingency plans, this is the question of, of using this water bank process that we're in the middle of. But there is a fundamental policy question that I wish we'd talk about, and we talk about a lot in this. Should the objective be to avoid a curtailment, or if a curtailment occurs, to survive that curtailment? And that's fundamental because you're going to operate reservoirs, you're going to do different things to avoid a curtailment than you are to, to survive a curtailment. Survival means Oh, maybe only, you know, maybe you only do certain, use water for critical uses and Denver gets a third of what it used to and the power plants only get to operate a little bit because you're, you're doling out this pre-1922 resource that people are willing to lease uh, to post-1922 post critical uses. 
So this question is really tops on our mind, and I think we're going to want to come back to that. And this is one of those issues at the IBCC that we've got to discuss. Uh, we know we have to discuss it, and we're beginning that process. Now, this is the amount of water that was probably used for agric agriculture as of 1922. This came out of the compact minutes. So this gives you an idea of about where we were in 1922 as terms of consumptive use. Colorado, pretty good shape, 1.1 million. Wyoming, 550,000. Utah, 538. New Mexico, 68,000. Not very much. But, uh, but Colorado is using about two and a half that times now. Uh, we, in, 19, in 2002, we used about 1.7 million acre feet, or 1.8. So you can see if we have to survive over a several years on just what we had in 1922, uh, it's going to be a pretty rough diet. New institutional arrangements, and we're going to hear from um, Professor Squalacci here on this, and, and this is going to be one of the basic questions that, that we all think about. Uh, is how much can these compacts bend? Uh, how much can we, in the face of a curtailment or in the face of declining supplies, in the, cl in the cl declining supplies and increasing demands, what happens? We've discussed there are, uh, there's a, in the past, there's a basic, there's a base, two basic problems. The upper basin doesn't want to deal with the curtailment issue. The upper basin is at risk for climate change. The lower basin is at risk because they're using far more than eight and a half million acre feet. They're using about 11 million acre feet. So is a grand bargain there possible? Is it even politically possible? Interesting question. Litigation. Uh, this is a, this is a, you know, ideally, Litigation is decided by the states, by the clients, uh, I say ideally, uh, but, and litigation is a common in water business. It's a common public policy tool. It's been used time and time again, most recently Arkansas versus Colorado. Right now, they're actually, I could say Nebraska, Colorado, and, and, um, and Kansas are still involved in litigation over the Republican River. So interstate litigation over water is commonplace, it's going on right now, it's been going on for many years, um, but at some point it raises the risks, it doesn't reduce the risks. It, it, for, it raises a lot of questions that you may not want to answer and you may be better off coming up with a collective solution among the states rather than forcing the courts uh, to make a decision. After all, courts will not solve problems. They will say who's right or who's wrong under their interpretation of those compacts, but when the court decision's over, you still gotta find a solution to the problem of supply and demand. So summary, risk management, it's, it is a top priority, uh, and the states and the entities that are prepared today will have the upper hand. So pr 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 old planning adage, be ready for the worst, hope for the best, but be ready for the worst. And in doing so, it's hard to say, well, gosh, we had a great year in 2011, and every year, like, every year is going to be like 2011. Well, no, I think there, we're going to have some 2002s in front of us and some 2004s. So we're going to have some future dry years just like we had 2011s, and we should be prepared, uh, and we should know what we're going to do in the face of a curtailment, uh, and that's one of our challenges. Uh, questions, thoughts, comments? Well, thank you, and, uh, oh, I do have one. Eric, uh, under the uh, upper basin uh, split out of percentage, uh, it's been widely accepted that Colorado and Wyoming haven't developed their full allocation, <laughs> supposedly. It, it, under a compact curtailment, do you believe that Colorado and Wyoming should get some credit for that? The question, well, and, and there, there's a real question. I think right now, a uh, question is should, Col it's widely believed that Wyoming and Colorado haven't developed their curtailment. I would agree with that with respect to Wyoming. I think Colorado, if you look at the data, you actually show that we're using more than 51%, percent we're at about 55%. So currently, if there were a curtailment, Colorado would be using more than 51.75%. Wyoming would be using less than its apportioned percent, I believe that's 14% or whatever. Um, Utah is using less. New Mexico and Colorado are above uh, Utah and Wyoming are below. 
Uh, so that's the current situation. Where that's going to be in the future, who knows? Those other states might pick up and catch up with us. Oh, the, the 48 Compact recognizes credit. But the 48 Compact has what we call a 10-year penalty box provision. So if you overuse in the face of a curtailment in the previous 10 years, you have to make up your overuse for those last 10 years before another state owes anything. And boy, that's, gonna, that's a very interesting one that's going to uh, have to be addressed. So you do, the answer is yes, the 48 Compact provides a penalty for the state or states that overuse in the face of a curtailment. Can you elaborate a little bit on your, on your very first point, which, um, and I'll probably get the wording incorrect, but that the upper basin states can't do anything um, to cause the delivery of water not to happen. Does that imply that if, they're, if we're in a drought situation that we're not responsible for the 7.5? The question is that the, the exact language says the upper basin states shall not cause the depletion to go below. And does that imply a serious drought means that we could go below 75. That's my interpretation. Boy, you're going to get lots of attorneys uh, that'll, uh, I think Jennifer Gimbel and the CWCB share that interpretation, but, uh, and I know they do, but still, uh, yeah, the assumption is when it says the upper basin states shall not cause the depletions to go below 75, that means with post-1922 rights, and it means nature can, and in my view it means pre-1922 rights, can cause the depletion to go below 75. That's, that's fodder for uh, lots of lawyers to send their grandkids through college. The Question, is the River District adequately preparing? Uh, and I would answer, I hope so. We, are the, we asked, uh, we had a joint meeting with the Southwestern Board now four or five years ago. We identified this as a joint, as those joint boards identified this as one of our priorities. Uh, it's been a little bit, uh, I will say, testy at times in dealing with the front range on this, but they're on, board, they're on board with us in looking at this water bank. So we're doing everything we can uh, to be prepared. Uh, is it enough? I don't know, I hope so. Uh, no, w w one more. One more? Yeah, first of all, I'm standing here to show the audience that this microphone's available for questions, but I do uh, want to ask, uh, the Flaming Gorge uh, study's been in the news, so it's an example of a project that, that's out there, you know, it could be any project, but uh, it does have a certain magnitude of, what, maybe 200,000 acre feet, so what would a risk analysis look like applied to a project, something like that? question is what would a risk analysis apply to a large project like Flaming Gorge? And there are other large projects, so let's not single out Flaming Gorge. Let's just say a single out a 200,000 acre foot project. And what existing users would have to say is, are, I, you know, are my rights more likely to be curtailed if we build a 200,000 acre foot project in the future? And the answer to that, I think, is pretty obvious, yes. Uh, and so the real question is out there. And we're going to balance if we were too conservative, we're going to leave a lot of water on the table that could be developed and can be used in Colorado. If we're not conservative enough, we're going to expand the impacts of a curtailment on existing post-1922 users. And that balance is what we're trying to, that's, that balance is what we're trying to address right now uh, in the IBCC and roundtable process. Yeah, but I don't want to say, don't single out a Flaming Gorge project because it's not just a Flaming Gorge project, it's any project that builds, that adds a large new depletion is going to increase the risk to existing users. But if we don't develop the water, we're also causing, you know, we're causing problems uh, for the state. So those are the things we're trying to balance. Hey, Eric, what are the other large projects out there, the other 200,000 acre feet potentials? The other ones, uh, well, we've, we've looked at the, what we call the um, uh, big straw, which would be a pump back from about 20 miles west of here out to the front range. We, we've looked at uh, historic, people have talked about a Blue Mesa pump back, putting a, you know, putting a pump and a straw in Blue Mesa Reservoir uh, and pumping that back over the front range. 
Uh, the, there was a study done that would have gone down the Yampa to about Maybell and pumped water uh, up and through and over around and under a couple of mountain ranges to the front range. Uh, so there have been three or four projects like that that are in that order of magnitude of 200,000 acre feet. All of them have this in common. They're far to the west because that's where the water is and they require a lot of pumping and a lot of, a lot of tunneling to get the water where it goes. 